Hey, welcome to the episode number four of The Everyday Entrepreneur. Uh, I'm Michael Johnson here today with Paul Budish. Talk about his uh, business he's had for many years and how he got into it. And uh, certainly, I'm sure, some fascinating topics and good discussion. And it's probably the first, maybe the only episode you'll did you ever get the, see. Did you get the memo on it? <laughs> <laughs> two people, two white glasses, two sets of white glasses today. So hope you enjoy this So who episode. had them first? Was it you did? Yeah. Okay, I think you might have been that guy. Yeah. But I, I, I got him without really consulting you. So anyway, I'm trying to copy you. I mean, yeah. you are my hero, but I. I just, right. Okay. So I, because okay, I, I just totally copied your style. <laughs> I got mine in two. The first pair I've had a couple pair. I got my first pair of white glasses in 2009. I think you beat me to it. I was about 2013 to get okay. on to get on the bandwagon. But it's so. a good look. If you're thinking about it, you need some white glasses consulting. Let us know. We'd be happy to. Yeah, I bought them as a lark, and then I got so many compliments. <laughs> I wear them all the time now. So, That's evidently, good. I mean, yeah, whatever, dude. That's what it's all about. Whatever makes cool. people think they like it. So. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's dive in. So you, so we've known each other for a long time. Yep. Um, mostly music stuff. Yep. I grew up playing in a band in high school, mm -hmm. and had some mutual friends. We played in your band. Uh, I don't know when you started that band. Particularly, you've probably been in a few bands. I've been in a lot over, of bands, yeah, over the years. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and had some really good success. Had some songs on the radio yep. and some different, some cool stuff. And by the way, we're here at uh, your beautiful house, the Palatial Estate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it's an awesome day. It's a nice, gorgeous out, yeah. summer, end of summer day in Minnesota. We don't have many of these days left, so nope. we're going to get as much as we can. But, um, but yeah, so so got to know you. That was probably 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, 10, yeah 15 years ago, probably. Yeah. Something like that. So, and then uh, put stay in touch and everything and see each other here and there and everything. But um, yeah, so that's been cool. But why don't you tell people about your business, how long you've been doing it? Yeah, sure, I will. Um, but but our it's interesting. Our paths kept crossing after that from yeah. various things that we've, yeah, with Sozo, yeah, Sozo uh, in, International which was wonderful, wonderful product. Um, and just through kind of, you know, I think we resonate with each other in a lot of our thinking. Yeah. So we've kind of crossed those paths of um, rolling our eyes at the silliness of the world and kind of <laughs> affirming some of, the, some of the things that are important. So, you know, yeah. obviously we have our faith in common and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, so the company I currently run is called Axel Companies. It's A C C E L L, uh, www .a -c -c -e -l -l .co. Not com. Is that is that a, it's C O because yeah. the hip guy from who built our website said that that's a cool thing to do. Okay. So I'm just like, hey, I'm not cool. You're cool. So yeah. I'm sure, whatever. So it is axel.co. So it was with two L's. Um, well, I started it off in 2004. I, our our 14th anniversary just happened August 6th. Okay. Um, I started it initially intending it to be an errand services company. Like it was kind of task rabbit before task rabbit. Um, simply uh, just as a person living on the planet who wished there was that service that existed in those times when I needed something done and I just did not have the time and the space and the number of miles and the ability to get done what I needed to get done. If I had four hours of stuff to do and I only had two hours, which is a very common thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so that's why I started it. I thought, hey, you know, and, and frankly, my back was against the wall. I, <laughs> I, have to, I had to feed my kids. I had to pay the rent, you know, simple stuff like got to pay the rent, got to feed my kids, you know, yeah. stuff like got to get groceries. So, um, and I couldn't find a job at the time. It was, it was, there, there was, it was a down economy in sense of no one was hiring anyone. Um, in jobs that I could get. I, I don't understand all what went into that. I did have, I had two college degrees, um, actually three at the time. I was well educated. I was well spoken. I communicate um, as not, obviously not evidenced here. But, I, but in 2004, before I was old, I could communicate really well. So I could, but I couldn't get a job. So I'm just like, forget this all. Everything I've done is crashed and burned. I failed at everything I did 
vocationally for 17 years. So I'm like, I have no, I have nothing to lose here. I'm just going to start doing my own thing because, because it's not working punching someone else's time clock. So, so it wasn't any more idealistic than, holy crap, I got to pay the bills and I, I, I'm not succeeding doing it any other way. So let's try something new. Um, so I launched Errand Plus. Um, uh, and so I started out and I wasn't selling anything. I just so happened to stumble across a friend of mine at, at Sherwin-Williams that I had serviced with a prior courier and was kind of, he's like, hey, what are you doing? I told him what I did and he's like, hey, can you take this run to Ham Lake? <laughs> so I'm like, so built into that errand services was a per mile, you know, because if someone's going to do, you know, put miles on their car for that errand service, mm -hmm. I wanted that built into the pricing model so that it would, you know, would accompany for that. But the main thing we were charging for was the service of getting that thing done on the other end, taking in your mail, taking your dog for a walk, picking up your, your keys and wallet that you forgot at the club, yeah. um, you know, whatever it was, this, you know, a million of things. Um, <clears throat> and and so I looked at how much that would be and how many miles I would drive, how long it would take, and I'm like, yeah, sure, I do that. Yes. Yeah. So, so, and without going into meticulous, boring detail, pretty much now the, country, the company, 14 years later, is very similar in that same spirit. Obviously, it would, it's more complicated with, you know, a lot more people and a lot more things going on all, all the time, but really it's pretty much... People, I mean, obviously people love deliveries. People love free deliveries. Uh, we don't do free deliveries. But I'm saying people have gotten used to the idea that you can get your stuff delivered instead of you having to pick it up. So yeah. we've thrived in that market because it's in the consciousness of, of people that I can get anything I want delivered. But really, just going back to the spirit of the company, it's, it's you know, I'm no genius, and I'm not an expert at much, you know, my expertise is in a couple things, drumming, and I know the Bible backwards and forwards. So I can bore anyone with theology, and I can rock your band. Other than that, I just am trying to fake it and get along. <laughs> so what the spirit of this company in, through the years has been, um, a lot of it has just been people saying, hey, can you do this for us? And us not knowing how to do it, but realizing we've got a potent team who can figure it out. We have ways to figure it out. Um, so we're smart, we're nimble, and we get it done for them. Yeah. So, so from there, it's branched out into a lot of different areas. Yeah. So. Well, you've been faking it pretty well. It's been 14 years. <laughs> you fooled you fooled a lot of people. Well, if you know, that's that's the thing. You know, I, 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 you know, you kind of accidentally discover, hey, maybe I, I might actually know what I'm doing, but I know better. So, I mean, we most of our 14 years has been year over year sustained growth, double digit gains. Um, we've attracted some premier customers, some customers that any other career company would absolutely die for. Yeah. Um, but we, but it's not. It's because we've been problem solvers on the ground for these companies in their in their ambitions that they want to get done. And for some reason, they're calling us, and we're we're coming through for them. So I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of that. So talk about. So, so you started the company. Yep. Just me and a pickup truck. Yeah. Yeah. 14 years ago. And now you have how many people, some employees, some independent contractors? Yeah, yeah. So we're a mix of independent contractors and employees. So I believe I just looked at all the checks that went through <laughs> in the bank account. Uh, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to a dozen employees mm -hmm. and about 40 independent contractors. And of those independent contractors, because we have a wide open contract, um, we're pretty, I feel like we've innovated in a lot of areas. We've figured out a way to get some amazing people who don't fit the traditional independent contractor model who just want to come in two or three hours a day. So we got about 40 contractors at any given time. There can be anywhere between 20 and 25 of them on the road right now. Yeah. So as we speak, there is somewhere in that neighborhood of, you know, 20, maybe two dozen people just running everything everywhere and getting a bunch of stuff done other than deliveries. Because like I say, we have innovative some services on the on the other end of the delivery, um, so yeah. So and 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 we yeah. And so we have our office, our brilliant office staff of about we have about four or five. We have five dispatchers, 
different shifts and, and working all the time. Uh, we have an ownership team of three right now. And uh, yeah, a bunch of employee drivers and then a group of independent contractors. Yeah. So the employee drivers, basically the idea is this, the, the employee drivers work our schedule that we set for them to add stability to our ability to, to carry out what we need to do. And then the independent contractors are people who can check in whenever they want to or whenever they don't want to, um, who... Just who th hoc. Yeah, yeah, and so with, <laughs> so the idea is that with all the random, randomness of all those different people, because people say, well, what if no one shows up? And it's like, well, you know, on a sunny Friday afternoon, the first warm sun, you know, sunny Friday afternoon in May, yeah. some guys don't check in. They're, they're drinking beer and fishing. Um, the reality is once you get enough independent contractors with enough random schedules, you end up with a, a, a total, a, an overall dependability yeah. in the randomness, if that yeah. makes sense. You're going to have so. that kind of average. Just yeah, it's, average it's a game right? of the averages, and sometimes yeah. we lose that, and we're... We're begging for people to take the work, and sometimes um, everyone wants to check in, yeah. you know, on a, bun on a boring Monday morning when nothing else is going on, right. and the customer doesn't need much, maybe everyone will check in, and everyone's like bugging our dispatchers, like, hey, I want more work, I want more work. So, so being an independent, independent contractor is a great gig, um, but there is a, there's an unpredictability on both ends. So we balance it out with employees, employee drivers, and, and the independent yeah. contractors. So you said something that peak manager. So you have th there's three owners. Yeah. You're part of you're one of the three owners yes. basically of the company. So how did that evolve from you owning it to bringing on other people buying in or whatever? It was very organic. Uh, so I went to I went to a friend of mine's. So I started the company just me. Yeah. Um, I think my total investment <laughs> my total investment may have been up to. $20,000 um, through different sources I had cobbled it together. Didn't have much. Um, I would say my initial investment was about $54,000 because then I went $34,000 into debt before I started paying myself. So a lot of people don't realize that when you see a CEO of a company where it's organically grown from an entrepreneurial side and you're, you're jealous that they live in the palatial estate in Woodbury, <laughs> I'm kidding, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> But but you you know you see them and you're like wow they do pretty good you know they make they make good money they get to go golfing now and again they've got a couple decent cars you know like how do you get there well the reality is I went negative fifty four thousand dollars to start with it ruined my credit um, so I had horrible credit but I, I did that to float the company and to make sure we could get through uh, because I had some really promising uh, things developing um, so here I was just me <laughs> negative dollars. Uh, went to a, a friend of mine's wedding, um, just so happened to bump into a friend of a friend who, be, who was seated at a table with me, who was an adventurous, had the adventurous entrepreneurial spirit, but really didn't want to be the guy on the hook to pull it off. Mm -hmm. But he, it got his blood, he, there's a certain type of person who that just makes their, makes their blood flow. Because despite all the stress and craziness of having your own company, there's something really exhilarating about it. I mean, at the end of the day, when me and my leadership team sit down and say, what in God's green earth just happened? This is insane. I cannot believe this. You know, whatever that, now that happens once a week. Yeah. So, sometimes but the, good, sometimes bad, probably. And sometimes, yes, it's, it's, at the end of the day, and I was just talking to a buddy of mine about this, and he was, he kind of, it was one of his big regrets that he never just sucked it up and went for it. Uh, starting his own entrepreneurial pursuit. Yeah. Um, he's like, I got a great life. Um, I have a loving family and a wonderful wife, and we have this great life. I got some money laying around, and I'm very secure, but I've always punched someone else's time clock. Um, and he asked me about that. And, and, he, and, and I told him, I'm like, at the end of the day, there are a lot of sleepless nights, and there's a lot of ridiculous things that happen. I could tell you stories that would just... I could tell a lot of stories, way more than, than this broadcast has time for, but um, at the end of the day, despite the negative crap and the wonderful stuff, it's at least at the end of the day, it's exhilarating, and you're living, you're living this life that you have on a level that you just don't when you're working for the man, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so here so I was. Yeah. So here I was. So at the wedding. Anyway, so I'm at the wedding, and I'm at the table with a guy named Jonathan Thompson, who's one of those guys. He just, it just gets him psyched up. 
And I, I had no idea he, he had these aspirations to invest in a company and start just digging in. He wanted to invest more than just a, an impersonal investor. He really, he had too cool of an important day job to really be digging in on a, as an employee, but he wanted to be somewhere in the middle where he could really get his hands dirty and invest. So he and a guy named Jeremy Hunt, um, who's no longer with the company, uh, just had these dreams and I had, the, I had this opportunity um, it, with, especially with Sherwin-Williams, um, which was, we were really killing our competition in the market and Sherwin-Williams did a, a lot of money in, in, in deliveries because they're sending a lot of construction materials and paint out to job sites. And there's 38 stores locally now. At the time there was 33. Um, and I just so happened to bring this up, not knowing he was a, he went as, he was an in, a yeah. small investment capitalist. So, yeah. um, he just got me talking. He asked me leading questions. I just thought he was being a nice guy and being inter interested in, in trying to make good conversation. In reality, he was asking me questions that were basically, "Hey, man, if I dump some money into your company, um, do you really ha can you pull can you can you pull through and yeah. make make money on and be profitable?" Um, and at the time, he decided he 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 could. So our company went from me and a pickup truck and just a couple drivers. He invested the money. We became a corporation because that's what happens when you have multiple owners. So we had one guy who was just a poor guy, who <laughs> broke, who, who was willing to really get in there and, and sweat, who had a lot of ideas. We had the investor who was a, 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 you know upper middle class dude who just had his dream. And then you had me who was kind of in the middle somewhere. So you know, uh, he invested the money. We brought this corporation together, named it Axel. We were driving up to my cabin to have a to have a shareholders meeting to kind of put some meat and bones on this dream, our skeleton dream. Um, and the accelerate, you know how uh, you have a, on your, on your uh, what do you call cruise control? Yeah. They, they, because you can't fit the word accelerate yeah. onto the little knob that you push, it just said Axel. And JT said, hey guys, what, a, what about this for a name, Axel? Okay. And we're like, yeah, that's that works, great. Yeah. So JT named it, and we decided to call it Axel. Um, uh, Axel and, yeah, Axel Curry at the time. Um, we diverse, diversified since then, and so our, our corporation is Axel Companies, Inc. But I think that that's a really important thing that, you know, if, if you're watching a podcast about, you know, entrepreneurism and that sort of thing, and, you know, kind of the going, the going presumption is that corporations are evil and, you know, corporations are... Oh, it's just people trying to, it's like, no, the reality is corporation is just, it's, it's some guys who were broke getting together saying, how can we pool our resources? And in order to have an entity that's the three of you, you can't be a three-headed monster. Yeah. You know, you need to be called something. Um, so a corporation is just kind of what you, <laughs> it's what you have, it's how you have to organize if you have people pooling their resources. Because yeah. the fact is, it's not, we're not three millionaires. We're mostly poor dudes and, and we formed a corporation. So, but with an um, ambition to go out and make, create something. Exactly. And since then, we've grown, we've innovated in the market. You know, it, it's not just growing in, in revenues, it's, it's creating cool stuff, it's creating cool products, it's innovating in your industry, it's thinking. It's thinking in ways that that what you're taking risks that can that actually do create opportunities and jobs um, because we're so widely varied in the way that we hire people. It's created an amazing amount of opportunities for everyone along the spectrum. People who who just want a full time job to people who just they need to pay some extra bills and they want a part time you know independent contractor gig to people who are some people use the independent contractor status to. Uh, to just be slackers and and they like to drink beer and go fishing and they don't want a nice place. Some people have used it, you know, and so the, but they still have a job they can go to. It's flexible. Other people have used it to in really tough times to to just say, hey, I'm gonna get out there and work my butt off and make a bunch of money and pay off debts. Yeah. Or, you know, let's say they just went through divorce or bankruptcy. We've had people just get in there and make great money. Um, and you don't have to do the selling, you just you just say, Yeah, I'll do the work and I send you the work. So, so going back to like, so when, when JT came on, had some money to invest, how did, what did you do with that? 
did, was that spent towards marketing? Was it spent towards building infrastructure to grow? Some, I mean, do you remember kind of how you? Yeah, I can't remember exactly what percentage was divvied up, but basically, yeah. basically the first thing was the visual presence. Instead of me going to Signs R Us and having them chop up some vinyl stickers, you know, we actually got a visual presence to get on our vehicles so that people could see we exist. Yeah. Um, obviously, with a name change, there there comes with a name change there comes. Uh, you got to reprint all the stuff, so it's reprinting all the log sheets and the, the you know, uh, that sort of thing. It was getting decent computers. Um, we had to make the jump as a growing company to a a proprietary software. It can't just be a guy. It can't just be me sending five drivers out from a Google spreadsheet, yeah. copying and pasting into their phones. We had to get a a proprietary software. Um, had to get a phone system because as if the phones are going to be ringing, you need more than just a guy's cell phone sitting in his pickup truck, um, you know, and beginning to really do a lot of those things. So th those are kind of the primary things that went toward, um, obviously, as we grew revenue. So we, we've grown very different. We've grown very organically. We're an all-cash business. We're, in other words, we're not out there getting giant loans yeah. from our Harvard buddy's grandpa. Yeah. We're just people who are growing the company as the cash flow allows. So we've grown organically, which has actually been really good for our customers, because then we didn't just get some giant lump sum of money and then hire anyone with a pulse, which is what a lot of the new companies, that's the new model, which is I, I'm, I'm not a fan of. Uh, it, we're very opposite of that. We've, we're, organic re, we're organically grown locally, plugged into the local economy. We're not money from outside from San Francisco or New York that comes in and plops a cookie cutter, you know, you know and I think there's just endless numbers of cookie cutter restaurant delivery companies and they all call themselves some catchy thing and they all have the same model and they don't, they're not discriminating about who they hire. They will hire anyone who can run their food around or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so being organically grown, we've only grown at the speed that we can grow smart and we have not gotten ourselves into a ton of debt. Um, so we, we grow from our profitability and cash flow, which is a really he healthy place to be. Um, the other thing that I think makes us unique is that I've done something instinctually uh, that if you were a Harvard Business School graduate, you'd, you call it running up market. Running up market is, I mean, it's the exact opposite of conventional wisdom. <laughs> conventional wisdom is let's commoditize yeah. the living crap out of everything. Yeah. I mean, and we we're left with a culture where people, if... People will buy a bag of dog poop if it's one cent less than a bag of gold because they saved a cent. And I don't, I don't ever want to be that kind of company. So the reality is, I lose most of my bids. Um, so I'm, I'm the opposite of that company who commoditizes prices, price gouge, you know, uh, not price gouges, but but lowballs on price and then gets a ton of people and gets a bunch of money in and and has a big splash. So we've, like I say without belaboring the point, we've grown organically from cash flow rather than borrowing and growing yeah. some big cookie cutter yeah. sort of organization. Yeah. And there, now, now the reality is it's not for most customers. Most customers like it commoditized, they like it cookie cutter. However, there is a, the, our, our sector of customers who want what we bring, the, the loyalty is much deeper. We've had Sherwin-Williams since 2004, you know, and we have not gone backward. We, we continue to grow with Sherwin-Williams, with word of mouth. Um, we've had Panera Bread. Uh, we are, even though they do hire their own drivers, we are their backup source, and it's pretty significant. Since 2000, late 2008, um, doing restaurant delivery, before there was a DoorDash, before there was a Bite Squad, and all the catchy floopy floppers, or whatever they call themselves. They, they all didn't have, have any drivers at that point? Or they, they had no drivers. We yeah. were their delivery system, yeah. and we literally... Once again, this is where a customer comes to us and says, we want this to happen. With Panera, I said, okay, that's impossible, because it was impossible. So they wanted us to pull off the impossible, but we, we looked at the revenues stream from what they would do, and we just said, oh, we'll figure it out anyway. Yeah. So we're a company who, instead of us figuring out some, from corp, some corporate boardroom in New York and then plopping it on the customer and saying, you got to order what we provide, 
we let the customers come to us and say, here's what we need. I know it's impossible, but do it anyway, and then we figure out the impossible for the customer. We've done it for a lot of, a lot of top shelf vendors, that, and, and, but that, that's kind of the, all goes all the way back to the spirit of in the beginning of when John from Sherwin said, do you do this? My brain said, no, we don't do that. And my mouth said, when I looked at the dollars, I'm like, yes, we do that. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll figure it out by the time I get to Newport. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a cottage grove Sherwin. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, if he wants to spend money at my company, I'll figure it out on the way. Yeah. So, so we're the company who figures that out. So we're very, very anti, uh, what would you, we're very counter corporate in our approach. We're very anti conventional wisdom. We go with our instincts. And our instincts have, have been winning the day for us. I mean, I, we're closing deals right and left. I, we're closing deals so fast I can't hire enough people to do the work. So um, just closed two major deals in the, last, in the last three weeks and one fairly big deal and some small ones. But, uh, so literally, I've had to stop selling. Yeah. I do both selling and recruitment right now. Sure. Saves us a lot of money. But I, that's another story. But my point is... Um, we're we're growing like crazy and 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 following our instincts has put us in that yeah. position rather than going with what are all the big official cool guys and you know entrepreneurs yeah. doing have you so because you do so much contract independent contract work have you seen especially in the driving space did you have you seen much change since like uber has gotten really popular or change like as far as interest in it or people out there wanting to do it or availability in it? Yeah, so there, it's two things. So there's these two factors. Uh, and at our company, we've always said recruitment is sales. There's something about it, because we, we have a product that we, we, people love our product. The customers love our product. We do a lot of things more than just delivery and whether we get into that or not, but we've innovated a lot of products that make us a unique source, a, a unique vendor, a, a unique, you know, um, what do you call it? A, 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 we, we make a great modular plug-in for companies who need things done that don't fit the exact mold of what's being yeah, offered. Out the, outside the box. Exactly, yeah. Well, they have, a unique, they have a unique problem to solve, and we find a unique solution, whereas most companies say, here's our generic list of solutions. If you like it, then choose one. If not, then sorry. Customer, and so my point is, so the labor, the labor force is this. Right now, it's a horrifically difficult labor force from a hiring perspective. Everyone has a job. So, so now, from the influence of Uber, and um, now Amazon just hires endless amounts of people. Uh, Uber, Amazon, DoorDash, all the, all the, all the delivery companies, and you know, Lyft, and people who use their own vehicles as independent contractors. So, um, it's done two things. There's a good side in that it's now, because it's so prevalent, it's now in the consciousness of a lot of people who don't fit traditional hiring yeah. roles or hiring sort of... Uh, well, they call it the gig economy. Like, you know, you, exactly, you, you, yeah. you, you just want a gig. You know? Yeah, so for all those people who do not fit a traditional hiring profile, what's happened is because there are so many of it, it's there's more people who've become aware that there's an opportunity there. So it provides more people. Um, there's actually three factors. So there's more people that know it exists. Second factor of the three is that um, they are in demand. So, <laughs> so because of all the new yeah. services. Yeah. And delivery is a big thing for people beyond just, you know, people, expect their stuff delivered you know they just they just do that was one of the reasons why we formed Excel fresh is because we sat down at Kilkarney Hills at a corporate meeting and we said we think that restaurant delivery is going to move from being a a neat uh, delicacy you know a neat yeah. service to people are going to expect it yeah now, there's from a lot of people from just catering to like any meal you ever get exactly <laughs> yeah so we're like and there's a lot of human beings out there eating a lot of food. So we're just like, let's position ourselves in this market. Um, the third factor then is the current. So then, so that A, now there's more people who are aware of it, so there's more people to do it. B, now there's more companies doing it, so they're eating up a lot of the labor force. There are actually a lot of my workers who do work for me then pop over and do Uber or, or do Bite Squad or whatever. They, they do both. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then the third factor is the current economy, which is just kicking butt and rocking it. And the labor, which is wonderful from an economic growth perspective, you know, there's stuff going on. However, when there's explosive economic growth, everyone has a job. Everyone's getting hired. So, so it's so you have it's, more phone calls of people wanting stuff delivered, but less because people, there's growing, yeah, because growing. the demand is growing, yeah, and there's yeah, more yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. More stuff that goes on, the more stuff needs to get yeah. delivered from here to there. Yeah. Um, but fewer people needing jobs. Yeah. So, um, so you know, the the person looking for work is in the driver's seat. Um, so if since I'm recruitment and I, and, and HR are kind of temporary right now, um, and I'm sales, so I'm right in the heat of both of those things. Um, I also play the executive role, which is a, another full time job. So I'm doing three full time jobs. But my point is, um, it makes for a unique challenge that I've never seen. So because the economy is here, obviously the, you know, I don't know, I'm not an economic guru, but the economies go like this. You know, we're right now in an upswing. It's tough to hire people. You know, in two years when the bubble bursts, which I think it will, you know, obviously, um, you know, it's going to be easy to find people because yeah. there won't be as much stuff going on and there will be people who are, whose jobs disappeared because their company doesn't need to manufacture the thing that everyone's buying. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a really unique labor market. But, yes, it, it's, yeah, the mentality's changed. There's more drivers. B, there's more drivers getting eaten up by other companies. So that so so really I'm competing I'm competing pretty hard to get good people. Yeah. So yeah. and I have to use other factors to attract those fantastic people. Yeah. And I'm getting them. I'm getting unique people because I offer some unique options that other couriers won't really go for. Okay. Cool. So So let's talk then a little bit about just entrepreneurship in general. <clears throat> so because I there's, I see sometimes there's different people. There's different paths you have to getting into entrepreneurship. Sometimes it's someone who's got this super deep passion about a certain business or product. Yeah. They want to get out there or service or whatever, and so they follow that. Sometimes it's someone that just kind of comes along an opportunity. Yep. And they and and their entrepreneurial spirit takes over and takes advantage of that opportunity. Yep. yep. Like for so for your story, it kind of seemed like the second piece. Like you were driving, you were doing some different stuff, but it really, the opportunity almost found you in a sense, and you obviously took advantage of it and had to work at it. Is it would you say that? Yeah. Well, my back was against the wall. I had to pay the bills, so I had to do something that was tangible. You know, I was still playing music. You know, at the time I was playing music, I was having some success at music. There's just not a lot of money in music. Um, I was working at Caribou Coffee, making eight bucks an hour as a barista. Um, so I would say, really, it was desperation. Yeah. I mean, and I finally grew up and real. I, when you're, I'm not trying to, I think it's rare for a younger person to seize opportunity. They, they don't get, I mean, they don't get, I mean, they don't understand that opportunities aren't just throwing themselves at you every, every 10 minutes. And when you're younger, there's more opportunity thrown to you. You know, just because people see you, you're younger, and they're like, oh, this person has energy. As I got older and the opportunities were less and less, um, and I had been through some really horrific years. I mean, pretty much there was a part of the winter of 1989 where I was basically homeless in a very, very cold winter. Um, and I just thought that the world was going to be traipsing along, handing me opportunities. You know, I was an athlete. I was a very, I mean, I don't, I'm not, okay. I was really good. I was, I was really good at some things athletically. Yeah. And, and so when you're in high school and college and you're a good athlete, Everyone just falls over themselves to tell you how great you are and give you opportunities until you get out in the real world and then you're like, no one's, no one's here to do me favors. <laughs> like, I gotta pay the bills. So I, but most of those 17 years I, it, before I did this was complete abject vocational failure. So I was just looking for any opportunity. Um, and so I, I, I seized on it. Yeah. In fact, I just hired, I just brought someone on She's in the same situation. She's 20, she's 27. She's from the inner city, single mother, had the whole, the world owes me everything attitude, you know, and, and she, you know, me and her were talking just about life and philosophizing about entrepreneurship because she has big plans. She wants to form her own LLC and hire more drivers. I have so much work that she can actually start her own company 
and I can feed her enough work to keep like three or four drivers busy. So, and I, I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurism, um, th that attitude. And, you know, a lot of people come to that place in their life where they're, where they just realize their back's against the wall and doing the same old thing over and over isn't working, why keep doing the same thing? Which is supposing that a magical, a magical bag of gold's gonna fall from the sky and they're gonna get to, get to be the CEO of Game Boy or some fun, you know, where you sit in a corner office and play games all day. It's like, no, that's not gonna happen. You gotta, you just, yeah. So, so I would say, yeah, you're right. But it, it, for me, uh, the passion evolved with the desperation. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, I think some people have the passion before. Passion, but like your 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 dream wasn't to since you were a kid to own a career business. No, sure. my dream was to be a rock star. Right. So I just so, want to play drums and drink beer. Yeah. So. But you found, but but you but you were doing stuff. You were be, trying to find opportunities. It was I was looking for, for I was looking for anything, and and frankly, my employers were horrible employers. I, I, they were, I'm not going to name names, but I had people rip me off. You know, sales jobs. It's very easy to steal from a salesman if you just steal his customers. Um, you know, and I worked in a church setting for a while and realized it had nothing to do with anything. It was so political, not political in the sense of Democrat Republican, but political in the sense of all the funny little political games you had yeah. to play to try to navigate. Uh, your dad was unwritten a pastor. Rules, yeah. So I'm sure you understand all the unwritten rules and all the little sub-factions in the church who are going to judge you for this and you know, all the little landmines you can step on. And I got sick of that because I wasn't in ministry to, to play politics. I was in ministry because I believed in the, in the kingdom of God and, 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 and the power of changed lives. So, but evidently church, the church at that time wasn't terribly interested in that. Um, the, so the... So I was just at my wit's end and looking for any opportunity, but I would say the desperation to seize on an opportunity just to not starve and just to pay and to not get evicted. That was the first thing. But as I as I grew in business, I really that that fire for it got ignited. Yeah. So so if anyone's listening today and you've thought about, hey, am I should I be an entrepreneur? And it's like, absolutely. I would say get the passion. Before you start, right? Unless you're, you know, instead of being like me, where it, it kind of grew as I saw. Oh my word! If I do something cool, you know, very Smithian, Smithian economics from the, I discovered, Adam Smith absolutely crushed it out of the park when his his big point was if you, the whole, the, an economy, a healthy economy is built on uh, one neighbor doing something really cool. For the, I don't think he used the word really cool. He used something more important sounding. But you do something really cool of value for your neighbor and your neighbor reciprocates. And that's real. All I'm doing is just a, a you know, a little more complicated version of doing something, putting something really cool out there yeah. that my neighbor says, that's really awesome. You know, obviously the most poignant examples, you know, something way above my grade, but, you know, the development of the iPhone and the Android, like someone does something and, and you, you please your neighbor, you know, pleasing your neighbor, which, which I think is a really healthy way to approach an economy rather than having it commanded and controlled from some higher authority like a bureaucrat. Or and Obviously, I'm yeah. exposing myself as a capitalist, but, um, you know, really, I think it's the healthiest when it's not a negative, compul a negative push out of compulsion from someone threatening you with government power. Um, it, it, it comes from goodness and saying, how can I make something really cool? How can I please my neighbor? Then your neighbor is going to reciprocate. Yeah. So, that's cool. and maybe I'm channeling Ammerman too. Yeah. I, I know you're a <laughs> well, big Ammerman yeah. fan. Some of that stuff, well, that, a lot of the stuff I did learn from Ammerman Well, that's too. one thing I was, uh, uh, before I answer this next question. If you do have any questions, you're watching live, post them now because we're, I'm going to get to that here in just a second. So the last question I have for you yes. is, as you've grown in the last 14 years of owning your business, are there... What are some of the things you've done to to grow? Other than you know on the job growth and stuff like that, have you are there certain things that you've plugged into certain books you've read that have really helped or influence you've had anything? Yeah, I think that every book I read is important, even if it's just a an ancient uh, Chinese philosopher or warlord philosophy. I just read a book called The Five Stones. I think it was. You know, obviously everyone, a lot of people have run Sun, read Sun Tzu's Art of War, um, all the way to books that 
you know, are really more, uh, you know, uh, prog politics, like lean in to, uh, to hard, the, the hardcore business science books. I've read the entire series by Clayton Christensen um, out of Harvard. Um, by the way, if, if the name Clayton Christensen is on it and you want just really great um, just business science a, a rudimentary education. He's a, he's a Harvard professor, but um, his whole series, mm -hmm. uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Solution, um, What Comes Next. He even wrote a book about, what you know, philosophical about what do you want to do with your life. Um, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, all the way to, I read The President of Strat for the next 100 years. I, I'm into futurism. Um, I'm into, you know, uh, just different... Everything I think I think so. My what I've done is I've set for myself because I'm so busy. Um, I've set a goal for myself to read 24 books a year, and I hold myself to it. And I make sure they're weighty books. They're from every political angle. They're from every every different type of topic. But I, they have to be weighty in some manner or fashion. So reading, um, just uh, you know, listening to people. I'm a I'm a very avid student of the culture and of people as well, observing where the culture is going. I mean, you and I just had a pretty significant discussion about the cultural trend and thought leaders and, and, and long form technology, yeah. talking about how exciting it is. I mean, just you're doing something like this. Yeah. It's, we're not doing a sound bite. We're actually having a discussion, you know, forever, you know, right. probably longer than you wanted to. But, um, <laughs> Um, so everything that I do plays, everything that I do and all of my observing of the culture and people, you know, even just stalking Facebook and Instagram and seeing what, what are people into? What, what excites, what inspires people? What, what, you know, where are people coming from? Where are we headed, you know, in a lot of different areas. Um, so all of that plays into, plays into my role as the CEO of this company. I think that, um, that the biggest role probably is the instinct you've been talking about, like being able to grow organically and instinctively. Yeah, that well, that's, that's, the, that. that's the big thing. Yeah. I learned after years and years and years and years of everyone telling me how it's supposed to be done that my instincts are pretty, pretty freaking good. Um, I'm not saying that to brag, yeah. but what that is is there are plenty of people offering you advice who, what, who are they, you know? But I used to listen to them because I'm always, you know, someone offers, if someone offers me a criticism or some advice, I always stop and, and take a look at myself. Maybe I was wrong. But the reality is at the end of the day when you, this is one of the keys. Though I would say if someone's listening to the podcast, um, if you have the same instinct day after day and you wake up for an, a year and a year later you're like, man, I really think this would work. I would trust your instincts and not go with what, what people are telling you. Yeah. Um, cause I, I had absolutely no success until I just said, forget it. How, you know, forget it. I'm going to go with my own instincts. However, when you go with your own instincts, you're also, you know, just like you can soar, yeah. you're on your own. If you fail, you know, there's, I've failed way more than I've succeeded. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say I would say go with your instincts, observe people, go with you know just like with me, man. I wish I had this service. Okay, well if I every day for six months I'm like crap. I wish I had this service. I would give someone money to do this. Well then, right. do it and get someone's money for you. Do that. Do that thing for them. So, yeah. So that that's that's how instincts have played in. And I I know they I know it sounds arrogant, but honestly, I would say. You know, because I, <laughs> I, I'm not going to name names, but there, a lot of my learning experiences, I've been a rapt learner um, from churches I've been a part of. I learned how to run a business unethically, and I, and I promised myself, I'm going to make sure that I, do, I run it the opposite of the way they did this. So I was an apt learner of, that's really rotten. I'm going to do it differently. Right. Um, right. So uh, there was a, the company, one of the companies I worked for before this. I took note of, I hate the way they treat me yeah. in this area, in that area. Okay, I'm going to start my own company and not treat people that way. Yeah. Um, so there's, so there's, you know, everything is, everything's a learning experience, especially now, the, here's the reality. 
about, tw I would say it's 80-20. I don't, I, there's, I don't have empirical data on this, but I would say from my experience, 80% of the time my instincts, when I disagreed with the way someone else does it, were right. 20% of the time I was abruptly proven wrong. Yeah. I, I just realized, okay, this is the reality to their gig. Yeah. Church has to do this. That's just a reality, man. Uh, the company, they have to do it this way. Sorry, like it, in a perfect fuzzy world with, you know, hopping bunnies and, you know, and Which, and and ha and dancing clowns, yeah. you know. But the world isn't fuzzy bunnies and ha dancing clowns. It's it's reality. You've got to make money, and you've got to. At the end of the day, you got to be profitability or your business. You have to be profitable or your business does not exist. Yeah, you can't be good to your employees if you don't have a business. If you don't well, have well, exactly. Have you can be good to zero people <laughs> yeah. if, well, there. yeah. I mean, we've been through that very recently with people who will, you know, one dumb thing in a vehicle, you know, and we actually, we, we had a guy get kind of mouthy with us about, oh, it's, you guys just make so much money off me. And we actually ran the numbers on his job. And the actual numbers came down to his one stupid little fender bender, um, to, it, I think we came up, it, it would have required his job to be flawlessly and productively executed for 22 straight weeks just to cover the costs on the fender bender. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not to mention the, the fake lawsuit that was threatened mm -hmm. uh, because someone had claimed they had emotional damage over a fender bender. <laughs> like the fender was dented about this much and she's like, uh, yeah, well, I, I have anxiety now. And it's like, I want thousands of dollars. And no, you're not, yeah. not going to get them because yeah. that's, that's absurd. That, that I understand and I apologize for my driver, but you had an accident in 2002. It was not my fault. Anyway, but my but point is... the challenges is, of the entrepreneur. Oh, the challenges of the <laughs> entrepreneur. And most people just do not get, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially when you're punching a clock and it's someone else's vehicle. Well, whatever, it's their vehicle. They must have a million dollars laying around. But no, the reality is that you've got to make money. So we have to be mean to people sometimes and, you know, have disciplinary action if they get in accidents because it's like, we can't have every driver every day get in an accident or we won't have insurance. So, yeah. you know, but my point is 20%, I would say 80-20. And I think most people would be in my boat. If you're an honest observer, if you can be truthful with yourself and not, I mean, some people are unrealistic, but if you can just be realistic with yourself and honest with yourself and, and have the same instinct most of the time, your instincts are usually very strong, yeah. but we're trained from ground zero, from kindergarten or pre pre kindergarten, that there's someone who's going to tell us how it's supposed to be. Yeah. So you've got to get yourself out of, you know, out of the thinking that someone else needs to do your thinking for you and tell you who you are and what you need to do. You know. Yeah. So. Well, it's right on point, and we're going to get to questions if you have them. But uh, I was just on a business training call, uh, conference call last week, and the whole topic was about awareness. And so number one being like self Was this with the Ammerman it was, group? Yeah. So oh, by the way, a little plug. <laughs> Ammerman is one of those. I, I took part in multiple trainings with Ammerman, uh, with his group of people. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. That is something, I haven't done it recently, but that's something that you talked about. How do you develop yourself? And, you know, that that was very foundational and formational in in my approach yeah. you know i kind of learned along with my business that uh, my business was already moving forward when i went to the ammerman yeah. training so yeah. i swear so he's that, not paying me to say that i actually <laughs> did and it was yeah and he's every, every second was my... worth every second that i any every penny i spent and every second i spent was yeah. well way worth it yeah well he's just talking about my, one of my mentors, Greg Ehrman, yep. and we'll probably talk about him more as we go along, or I'll interview him at one point too. But um, oh, I'm watching yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, we were talking about awareness. I'm like being self-aware is really important. Yeah. But then also listening to, you know, he calls it the voice of God, like your inner yep. voice that 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 intuition you have, and being able to yeah to listen to it and be able to weigh out, you know, what you need to do. Yeah. How important that is. So, Excellent. Let me see if we have any questions. From anybody that I guess would, I don't know if there's a lot of people out there looking to start their own driving business. Drop around the comments. Matching white glasses. I got some comments on the, <laughs> on the glasses. That's all you got out of this was the matching white glasses. Thank you. <laughs> Current throttle is 3215. 
<laughs> I don't know what that means from Colin. Uh, Colin. Okay, Colin's my dispatch manager. Okay. Uh, my brilliant, I need to mention my brilliant yeah. leadership team. Yeah. Um, Colin Gibbs is a drummer. Yeah. And you know, he's a yeah. really good, really creative drummer. Um, really smart. Our throttle report is is kind of our, the thr if you can imagine the number of people working with the amount of business that you have, it, it has to be, it has to work together. Yeah. If you have too many deliveries at, at one time and not enough drivers, you're gonna lose customers. If you have too many drivers, and not enough deliveries at the time. Um, you lose drivers. You lose drivers because yeah. the drivers, or they check out, and oh, whatever. So we really pay attention um, to what's called the throttle. The throttle is how do those two interact. Um, I do need to give a shout out as well to Elijah Edwards is our director of operations. He's the third owner in our company. Absolutely brilliant individual. Hardest working, most dedicated dude. And he's, you know, the, what I love about him, is that he's a good person yeah. beyond just being a great worker and dedicated and goes to the ends of the earth. He's a good person. Um, so I really, character is everything at the end of the day. Um, so uh, he, we brought him into the ownership group because we just felt it would be right if a person participates in the company it, on an own, if takes ownership in the yeah. company, they should, be, they should be compensated with ownership, yeah. you know? So Elijah Edwards, I got like I say, I got a great. If I start mentioning people, I got like fifty yeah. people I have to mention. But anyway, so those are some of my core leaders: uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Devine, uh, Matt Leith, a um, couple of other dispatchers that we have going on. Um, and yeah, just a lot of great. A lot of I, I'm surrounded by. I'm so Which blessed to be surrounded cool, by great well, people. Maybe we can finish on this. But another cool advantage of being an entrepreneur is you get to work with people that you like, right? I know you've had a lot of people you've been in bands with the work that you've worked with. Totally. Um, well, one of the great things about having this independent contractor opportunity is we've, I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons I started my own business, I was doing so much playing and touring, I had to be able to be my own boss because no boss would put up with me playing so many shows. Yeah. And my customers were just so enamored. And my first, my first person that I brought on was Luke Albertson. He was my bass player in my band. Because we both had to be playing yeah. gigs, and we're like, how are we going to do this? And in the beginning, our customers were just so enamored with, oh, that's so cool, you're in a band, <laughs> um, that they would forgive us and just use another courier when we were out of town. So we had to custom tailored. Eventually, customers started actually expecting us to act like a company. Yeah. So we did a little more of the business and a little less of the touring. Um, we've helped an amazing amount of actors and financial planners and musicians um, who can get a part-time gig and come in there and make money when they're not playing and who have other gigs. We have actors like the, we had the beard scratch off commercial guy for a while. Whenever he didn't have an acting gig, he'd come in and work. Yeah. We had concert promoters who, who were festival concert promoters. During the summer, they were nowhere to be seen, but they needed a job in the winter. Yeah. Um, uh, it's been especially exciting lately um, with, the, with the chugging economy to see a lot of entrepreneurship from the inner city, a lot of minorities and, and recent immigrant groups. It's amazing in Minneapolis how many immigrant groups who are just trying to get their foothold. Unfortunately, in America, and I'm not saying it's someone's fault or everyone's evil, but the reality is usually a lot, some of the minority groups and some of these immigrant groups are the last off the bench to really benefit from a good economy. It's really exciting because I'm face to face with them I get the front row seat to see them move off the bench and, and really get in the economic thing. And there's a lot of fresh entrepreneurism coming from the inner city, and it's exciting. Yeah. Um, it's exciting that people are thinking in those terms and finally giving up on, I got, I got to punch the man's time clock. You can, do your, you can be your own boss. Yeah. So, that's cool. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, well, that's yeah. awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. I know you got to contract to sign in 20 minutes. I got a contract to sign in 20 <laughs> minutes. And, I, and so, interestingly enough, a recent immigrant from, I believe, Egypt. Wow. Um, so, That's cool. um, someone who came from, and she, she actually wants to uh, start her own LLC and hire some of her own. In fact, she already has her first employee, and I'm going to be able to feed her the work to get it done. Yeah. So, so we're going to bring Nahal, Nahal onto, the, onto the crew. And... Uh, yeah, so so it's pretty cool to see those fresh roots of entrepreneurism because, yeah, well, especially from traditionally groups who have entered, 
yeah, we, we and and without getting too long, and I know I got to go and you got to go, but but really, one of the things I'm most proud of is I'm passionate about opportunity, and I'm we have a unique we have a unique opportunity with a particularly low barrier to market entry, so we're a wonderful a wonderful source for people who are traditionally left out of good economies. So yeah. that's been really exciting and. Um, I mean, not 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 that I I don't want other people outside of the you know if you're just a straight up boring American who's American American I'll still I'll still work with you but the point is it's exciting when you know that groups that have been left out of the main flow of the economy are getting in there and being entrepreneurial that's the key that's the key that unlocks the cage to to freedom for them um, it's exciting to be on the front row talking to them over a table and signing a contract with them and saying, I got this, I got this, I can, I, I can give you this route, I can do this, and you know, th we can provide this service and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that is, as you can tell, I'm excited. Yeah, I I, I, it's exciting to oh, me, so, yeah. well, and I, that's visceral. So. I, that's why I started the show. I could geek out on it all day long. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> huh? So, but cool. Well, I appreciate your time. All man. right, dude, it's good to talk to yeah, you. We'll it's put, exciting uh, what you're doing. We'll put, if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever, we'll put the link to excel.co. Dot .co. Dot the, web, co. The hipster web guy said that was cool. Dot .co. So, uh, CO so standing we'll, we'll for that, C cool. Yeah, C, okay. I, I don't even know. So we'll saying. put the link. So if you do, if you're in the Twin Cities uh, of Minnesota and you got uh, need some services done. Absolutely. We, we do a lot of things beyond just deliveries. We do a lot of restaurant delivery. We do a lot of catering, catering setup. We do merchandising of food on the other end when we, we deliver it to stores and merchandise. Or we do delivery of the food and serve, do f kitchen setup and serving as well. So we have a lot of auxiliary services, but a lot of what I think is, you know, I'd put a plug in is go, go, go to the upper right about us, drop down to current opportunities. If you want a part-time gig as an independent contractor and want to have your own little micro business, I got plenty of work for you. So yeah. um, cool. bring it on. All right, awesome. Well, sounds good. Thanks for watching episode four. We will see you next time.